Good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I would like to thank Finance Watch for inviting me to speak in this conference, uh, this web conference on climate related issues. This is a good opportunity to exchange views on the EU regulatory framework and the climate related financial risks, as well as broader sustainability aspects. Sustainability and the transition to greener economy continue to be top priorities for the EU political and regulatory agenda. Importantly, it's not only here in Europe, but also globally, where international com commitments on climate and sustainability objectives are actively discussed by policymakers. Following several years of increasing hot and dry summers in Europe, the most recent being the most extreme in 100 years, the implications of climate change are becoming even more of a concern. In addition, we're now also facing a growing energy crisis, which is already reflect affecting businesses and households across Europe. But every crisis also presents opportunities for change, and change itself also presents opportunities for companies. I would therefore like to focus on how can we, the banking regulators, contribute to these changes to guide the banking sector and also the wider society to become both more sustainable and more resilient. As you all know, banks and other financial institutions have a key role to play in the allocation of savings to investment. And by doing so efficiently, they can therefore facilitate the transition to a greener and more sustainable economy. And the ABA, we have been actively supporting the process to integrate environmental, social, and governance, i.e. the ESG factors, aspects into the EU banking sector. Today, I will provide you with some insights into the regulatory changes that are aimed at incorporating ESG in the banking sector, and more specifically about what the EBA has been doing to achieve greener and more sustainable economy while ensuring that the banking sector remains resilient. Because I think it is important to emphasize and we will agree that in the quest for a sustainable economy, it is important to remember that only a robust and stable financial se sector will be able to effectively provide the necessary financing for the transition. The EBA and other regulators have for some time been working on sustainable finance. EBA's work program on ESG risks include key areas such as risk management, disclosures, supervisory practices, climate stress testing, and possible adjustments to the financial framework. Most recently, we have also been working jointly with the other ESAs on a common definition of green growing in financial activities. An adequate regulatory response to the new challenges related to ESG risks requires appropriate sequencing of this work. First, the new or increasing risks have to be well identified. This is the first step to start managing these risks within the overall framework. Therefore, the ABA started with publishing a report on the management and supervision of ESG risks in June last year. This report aimed at providing common definitions and understandings of ESG risks for banks, as well as provided overall recommendations for banks and for their supervisors to take these risks into account in their risk assessments and policies. But for assessing risks, one needs to gather relevant data. I, we need to enhance our disclosure and measurement of climate-related risks. Therefore, the ABA prioritized the work on disclosure requirements, and in early this year, we published our Pillar 3 disclosure requirements on ESG risks for banks. This is, in our view, a key milestone towards availability of comprehensive and comparable information on ESG aspects that will significantly increase the transparency of markets. The EBA's proposal on Pillar 3 requirements aims to help investors and other participants of financial markets to get relevant information on ESG risks associated with lending and investment activities of banks. For this, we have adopted a sequential approach by starting with a focus on quantitative disclosures of climate-related risks, and these requirements will over time be expanded to include also other environmental, social, and governmental objectives, as well as to enhance the coverage to all the loan portfolio of the banks. One of the biggest challenges in the context of ESG related work, including the initiatives undertaken by banks, supervisors, regulators, and other market participants, is the li limited availability of high quality of data. However, this is where I also believe that financial institutions can make a significant contribution and appropriate effort should be focused on that aspect. Financial institutions, by asking their clients for information, evidence, they can also increase the sensitivity and aware awareness of those clients to climate-related risks and encourage them to enhance their ESG risk approaches, therefore also uh, enhancing the speed of the transition to the sustainable economy. 
data collection should start from the beginning and the long origination process of banks is the beginning of the relationship with a, with a client. By asking the counterparties at that time to provide ESG related information, will inevitably increase understanding and also help make it an integral part of financial decisions by firms. Those of you who have recently been involved in any real estate decision in your private lives already know that energy efficient, for instance, is one of the main considerations when buying, renting, or renovating a property. And this is what makes banks already take into account what decided what they're willing to finance and under what conditions in this market. Disclosure requirements for financial institutions will increase therefore data availability, quality, and comparability, which currently rem remains a notable challenge across the industry. However, data is also important for financial institutions for their own ESG risk management, and the ABA published a report on management and supervision of ESG risks in June as last year, as I, as I mentioned before, where we recommended that financial institutions incorporate ESG risks into their risk management, governance, and business strategies. This risk should also be part of regular supervision by supervisory authorities. We're also working on further guidance towards the integration of ESG aspects in the supervisory review and evaluation process. Supervisors are expected to include ESG risk proportionally in their analysis of banks' business model, especially in the assessment of the business environment and the bank's strategy as well as when assessing a bank's individual risk profile. The assessment of ESG risks should be more comprehensive for those banks that are more exposed to these risks. In this context, we need to bear in mind that ESG risks are relevant not only to large and systemic institutions, but also for smaller and local institutions. Any bank may have concentrated assets that will be affected by physical or transition risks related to climate change or generally by ESG risks. Therefore, it's very important that all banks that are exposed to ESG risks significantly address them appropriately in the risk management process. Although we continue to see that these roles should be applied proportionally, especially vis-a-vis -vis the complexity of risk management methods and tools. The uncertainty and forward-looking nature of ESG risks, especially environmental risks, poses significant challenges. Therefore, in addition to the assessment of ESG risk banks are currently exposed to, we also need the financial sector to be tested regularly and based on different forward-looking scenarios of possible outcomes in the future. Banks will be expected to incorporate climate scenario analysis in their risk management process, and we will provide further guidance on the use of climate-related stress test analysis by financial institutions. The supervisory community is also actively working on enhancing their own capacity to perform climate scenario analysis. The ABA complete, completed its pilot climate exercise in 2021 with a sample of, of volunteer banks and a number of national supervisors, and also have, and a number of national supervisors, excuse me, including the SSM and ECB more recently, have concluded several early versions of climate stress tests. Based on the lessons that we learned, we're now preparing the launch of comprehensive stress tests in the EU, which should contribute to better understanding of climate risk by banks and supervisors. This will include regular stress testing of the banking sector, as well as system-wide uh, stresses of the financial uh, sector with other supervisory authorities and the ECB and ESRB. Finally, the, the ABA recently started to assess the appropriateness of the pillar one on funds requirements in the context of ESG risks. The overall prudential framework is a complex machine with many interlinked elements. Pillar one requirements are just one, one part of it. I've spoken before about pillar three disclosure requirements and also enhancements in risk management characteristics that are at the core of the pillar two assessment. Therefore, careful consideration is needed to identify the relevant risks and to find the best tools within the prudential framework to address them, be it pillar one, pillar two, or pillar three. This is why we consider it crucial to first look at the existing allocation of capital with respect to specific exposures. And so we ask ourselves in this discussion paper, to what extent are the ESG-related risks already captured by the current prudential framework, either directly or indirectly? And is there anything that is not currently being captured and in addition that remains to be accounted for in the existing framework? Another important question that comes to everyone's mind is if and by how much will the capital requirements increase if a new risk is asked to be addressed? 
Will the overall level of risk in the banking sector increase as a result of climate change? Or does the transition to sustainable economy lead primarily to reallocation of risks between specific sectors and entities? What will be the role that innovation can take in this process as we go forward through this transition? We pose these and many other questions in the discussion paper on the role of environmental risk in the prudential framework. The public consultation on this paper ended last month, and we're grateful to all respondents, including the final watch contribution for their comprehensive responses. We will now continue the analysis, taking into account the feedback received with a view to publishing the conclusions in a final report over the course of next year. Here, I would like to emphasize that while we fully support the transition to a more sustainable economy, the primary role of the financial framework is to ensure the financial soundness of institutions including through the own funds requirements and financial stability overall. We're therefore aiming at the banking sector, aiming at a banking sector that is strong and resilient so that it is able to properly channel the needed funds to facilitate the transition to a sustainable economy. This is the main objective of this work on potential requirements. Finally, let me also make some short remarks on a challenge that we also need to be aware of, namely the legitimate use of green sustainable claims the so-called greenwashing. This may vary from the small to large-scale scale market manipulations as illustrated by the recent DWS case. Greenwashing can occur at different stages of a product life cycle, but it's not necessarily related to a product, but also claims at entity level. The inherent problem is that it provides misleading information to clients and markets, and it can also give the competitive advantage to certain firms that is clearly unfair and generates a level playing field. This risk is growing as green finance is booming, but the green regulatory standards, including the EU taxonomy, the green disclosures, and the EU grand bond star that's been developed are not in place yet, but should help in this clarifying. Greenwashing is a concern within the regulatory community, and we're paying more and more attention to it together with the EU Commission and the other sister authorities, ESMA and EOPA. Greenwashing can cause significant use and quantum risks with a negative of impact on its stock prices, earnings, and a loss of confidence by investors, by depositors, or even by interbank market participants. This raises potential concerns with respect to the longer term health of financial markets in this area. Should the greenwashing cases occur more often, it may affect the reputation and the trust in the green finance sector as a whole. This could be detrimental not only to the banking sector itself, but also to the overall efforts to finance the transition to a sustainable economy. For this reason, we started the work on greenwashing risks. We'll be looking into the overall developments in this area across the EU, as well as the supervisory tools and practices regarding monitoring and addressing this issue. Let me conclude. Considerations on sustainability and greener economy have become one of the key elements in the way institutions work and also in our regulatory work agenda. We're confident that progress has been made. We can also see the banks are adapting their strategies and risk management process. But this does not mean that we're close to down and we can feel comfort. On the contrary, we may be at the, be at the end of the beginning, but we still have a long and rocky way to go. We all need to continue our efforts, act quickly but simply, sensibly, and we need to choose the right tools. Climate change is a global challenge and it has to be addressed globally. It is therefore crucial to work closely also with our partners in Europe and beyond and to continue the international cooperation that has been up to a good start so far. We will therefore continue our mission with the goal to achieve a real trans transition to a sustainable economy where strong banks play a key role. In the end, we all want to live in healthy environments that are climate resilient and supported by resource efficient and fair economies. Let's work for that goal. Thank you very much for your attention, your interest, and for the invitation to be here today.